Hello, everyone. Welcome to Talking Logistics, where we have conversations with thought leaders and newsmakers in the supply chain logistics industry. It's my great pleasure to welcome today's program, Doug Pollard, who is Sales Director, work Workforce Business Unit at Quintic. And today we're going to talk about, is workforce planning the weakest link in your supply chain transformation journey? Now, one of my predictions for 2016 was that workforce planning was going to be in the spotlight this year. Uh, when you look at a lot of the uh, areas that supply chain logistics executives have been working on over the past few years, have been in other areas of supply chain planning and optimization. And really the one area that I would say has kind of been uh, in the shadows or hasn't been a priority until now has been workforce planning. And, and that's becoming to uh, create some issues for, you know, manufacturers and retailers and other companies out there in the industry. And, um, you know, certainly it's an area that I'm beginning to see more and more companies start paying attention to. And I, we're very fortunate to have Doug with us today here to share some insights and advice based on, you know, the, the companies that he's worked with in this area uh, and helping to get companies on the, on the right path when it comes to workforce planning and optimization. Uh, I just want to remind those of you that are joining us live today that if you do have a uh, question for Doug as we're having our conversation here, uh, you can post it via the submitted question uh, 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 window. And uh, if, if it's a good and appropriate question and we have time, I'll certainly weave it into the conversation. Uh, so with that, Doug, welcome to the program. Hey, thanks for having me. Doug, you know, you're, you're a first-time guest here on, on Talking Logistics. And, uh, you know, when we ever, whenever we bring a new guest on board, uh, I always just like to get a little bit of uh, understanding of their background and kind of what their role and responsibilities are now at, at their current uh, company. So why don't we start there really very briefly. Why don't you tell us a little bit about kind of your career path, you know, how you ended up there at, at Quintic and, and focusing on, on workforce planning, and, and then we'll dive into the conversation. Sure, sure, great. Um, so, you know, the last 20 years or so has been majority spent within sales and sales leadership roles within the high tech space, be that software companies as well as um, you know, high end medical equipment. So, um, last five, five or so years have, have been in a combination of business intelligence and supply chain management companies. So, um, joined Quintic uh, here about eight months ago and uh, excited to be here. And my role now is to uh, run all the sales and marketing efforts across North America for our workforce business unit. Great, great. And, uh, you know, certainly I, I know this is what, like I, I said in my opening remarks there, you know, workforce planning is certainly something that's on, on, the, on the radar for, for a lot of companies um, and a growing number of companies. Uh, you know, what I find is that, you know, depending on the context, you know, the term workforce planning, you know, means different things to, to different people. So, so let's start there with, with kind of a basic question, right? What is workforce planning from a supply chain management perspective? Well, put really simply, uh, it's getting the most out of your people. And so the reason why you do workforce planning is to, you know, primarily to drive efficiencies. Um, in many cases, for a lot of companies, it's around improving their service levels to their customers as well. Um, so we're starting to see it being taken much, much more seriously than it has been in the past. And people are realizing that the, the human capital element of the whole equation is extremely important to their, to their bottom line as well as their uh, you know, customer facing service. You know, certainly there, there's so much focus, you know, these days and, and so much buzz around, you know, talent development, right? And, the, and it's around, a lot of the conversation has been around, you know, how do we find the right people? How do we hire them, train them, retain them, right? But uh, I think that the part that's been missing in the conversation has this, is this whole area of workforce planning, right? Then how do you actually effectively leverage them uh, within your operations and schedule them and making sure that the right people with the right skills are in the right, doing the right tasks, so on and so forth. I mean, are you seeing that, the kind of the conversation getting broadened beyond kind of the, the hiring and training and retaining, that now it's also, okay, well, how do we actually effectively leverage them? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, you know, it's one thing to, to have the, you know, the, get the right talent in-house, but then when you have them, what do you do with them, right? Um, and so any kind of an environment where, especially in environments that we work with, will be uh, companies that have employees that are moving around, I'll say. Uh, people who have non-static schedules. So anyone outside of a nine to five schedule um, is a good target for having, making sure you have a good uh, plan in place for them. So uh, yeah, so we're seeing it across tons of different industries. Everything from service industries like airlines and rail to, um, to even to manufacturing companies. Uh, so if you think about maintenance workers uh, within a manufacturing environment, 
um, their schedule could change on a daily basis, if not an hourly basis. So, yeah, it's really quite broad, but um, yeah, there's so many opportunities for it, so much untapped potential out in the marketplace for it right now. It's just a really exciting time to be here. Right. I mean, I know, you know, putting together my predictions, uh, you know, for, for this year, you know, one of the reasons that, um, you know, I, I made this prediction about workforce planning. Well, one of it was I had the opportunity to attend, you know, a couple of your user conferences last year, and I heard a number of presentations uh, for some of your customers, and that really opened my eyes in terms of, you know, how complex and challenging this is for, for a lot of companies. And secondly, even if you look at, you know, articles in the Wall Street Journal, um, and you look at the retail industry, you know, one of the challenges they have around the holiday season is, you know, scheduling, you know, their, their employees to work, you know, uh, extended holiday hours and, and things like that. And, and they're, you know, uh, so you see it in kind of the mainstream uh, media, if you will, business media, and sort of the challenges companies have in that area. Um, you, you know, when, when, when you think about other areas of supply chain planning, um, you know, you, you, you tend to have kind of a, a long-term I would say strategic component to it, right? Where you're thinking about, um, you know, months in, in, the, in the time frame of months or years in terms of trying to think through things. And then you also have kind of a short term or, or nearer term operational component to it. Um, is the same true when it comes to workforce planning? Is there a kind of a long term uh, strategic component to the, that, the planning equation and uh, as well as a near term operational component to it? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think people tend to think of it much more in terms of the short term. Like, what do I need to get done, you know, this week or today or right now at this very minute? And, and that's just, it's just easy to get caught up in the moment, right? We all do it. Um, and then I think from a long term employee planning perspective, you know, anything beyond a year tends to be done, say, in an HR department. And you talked about talent acquisition and planning for growth at a company or, you know, launching a new product and hey we're going to you know we're anticipating a 10 percent growth in sales next year how are we going to support that um, now those two different areas of the business hr and maybe the operations side of the business if they're working in a siloed environment running off of different systems like one's running off an hris system and the other's working off of their um, you know their crm system or their erp system and they're planning their people maybe in uh, what we usually see is excel spreadsheets um, there's no correlation there between the long-term plan and what they need on the street day of operations. And so if you're doing your long-term planning and not drilling into the details of seeing how it affects, say, what your operation looks like today, um, perhaps your long-term planning isn't quite as effective as it could be and you're setting yourself up for failure. So we absolutely encourage companies uh, to look at we say all three time horizons. So the long term, which can be anywhere from you know six months to eighteen months, is how most people use Quintic, um, to the short term, you know, matter of months down to weeks, uh, down to a day of operations approach. So, and if you have all of that in kind of one holistic system that someone, a planner, can look at and figure out, um, not just you know how does the long term plan affect day of operations, but vice versa. You know, if we make a decision today about uh, doing this thing. How is it really going to affect our costs? Are we impacting overtime? Things like that. So, um, yeah, it has to all be tied together if you're going to truly maximize the return on your human capital. Yeah, I, I like that, the way you, you kind of broke it up into those kind of three horizons, if you will, or three components to it. I mean, with the companies you talk to, um, you know, out there in the market, I mean, what do you see as the, the, the weakest link for them? Is it that long-term perspective that they're kind of missing the – the, or they're not doing enough in that area, or they're missing the tools and systems to do that effectively? Yeah, I, I would say the, the correlation and tie-in and putting it all together is probably the, the, the biggest uh, challenge. Now, it depends on which company you talk to, because some companies are excellent at the long term, and then it gets down to the day of operations and the short-term planning, and again, that's being done like on spreadsheets or on someone's desktop, and heaven forbid that person leaves or the file gets corrupted. Um, so, you know, it just depends on who you're really talking to. But I think it's, it's a rare breed that is doing it really well across all those timing horizons. You know, it, it's, it's, funny to hear, it's funny to hear that uh, Excel is also arguably the, the dominant uh, tool that's used in workforce planning. I, I've written and, and talked about how uh, Excel is probably the, the most dominant enterprise software tool out there in, in, you know, for transportation management, warehouse management. And it seems like uh, for a lot of companies, it's, it's, it's true in uh, workforce planning as well. Um, 
you know, so let's talk about, I mean, I, I kind of already gave a little bit of why I made that predict, my, my prediction for this year in terms of why I'm seeing it elevated, uh, the importance of workforce planning being elevated this year. I mean, from your perspective, again, out there uh, uh, in the field, talking to different companies, talking to customers, I mean, why do you see or what are they telling you that workforce planning is uh, you know, becoming more important for them? Well, quite simply, it's for a lot of the companies that we talk to, um, most of them on my side of the business and in my business unit, we tend to talk to more service providers than manufacturers. It just happens to be the business unit that I'm in. Um, but um, it, it's if you look at anyone's balance sheet, it's probably the largest line item on any balance sheet is your employee costs. You know, so labor costs, your, your benefits that get layered on top of that. Um, it's a huge driver for any organization, huge cost position that they have to be very cognizant of and aware of. And even little tiny increments and small improvements to how efficient your people are working and how you're scheduling them uh, can have just massive, massive um, cost savings. And so I think you know, executives are starting to look at it and go, you know, I mean, it's always been, a, you know, how do we get more efficient, right? And everyone always has these big goals for the year, and here we are getting started in the new year and you know, laying down goals, and you know, your department has to have a 10% efficiency gain this year. And, you know, department directors are scrambling trying to figure out how am I going to get 10% efficiency while we're growing. You know, so it's, um, it's actually a pretty easy thing to do when you start to plug the numbers in and you see how, you, how you're scheduling your people and figuring out you know, what is our utilization rate right now for, for our service techs out in the field. Um, are they on average, you know, two hours a day sitting in a truck waiting for a work order or a task to come in uh, for them? Or are we sending people to one location and they're crossing right over a tech, uh, you know, in, in that path because we just didn't have the visibility into where people were at that particular time? Um, so there's a lot of, I mean, we look at it as being pretty easy once you plug it all into the system and, and take a look at it from a, you know, forest for the trees type of approach. Um, but I think when you're down in the weeds, it's really, really difficult to, to make that correlation. So, so again, the, the, the cost driver is probably the biggest reason why people are waking up and saying, we have to do something, and you know, we have to do something today. Now, now how about, uh, and, uh, you know, things like, you know, particularly in those workforces that might be unionized, right? So there's all sorts of, of, of union or, or labor related regulations or agreements that have to be taken into uh, account as part of how they plan and schedule. Uh, is that, a, is that another component of it as well? Kind of regu labor regulations and, 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 and kind of the, the things that are negotiated as part of, uh, uh, labor agreements? Yeah, yeah. So one of the biggest challenges that the companies face are all those requirements that they have to plan around. Um, so requirements can include, obviously, in any kind of unionized environment, all the labor rules that have to be in place. Uh, sometimes there's regulatory rules that they have to follow um, around, you know, an employee can only be, you know, driving a truck for X number of hours per day, um, flying an airplane a certain amount of time per day. Um, you know, those are safety regulations and put in place for good reason. Uh, so there's those things, but you also have things like skill sets. So this particular driver can only drive this type of truck, or this particular type of pilot can only fly this type of plane until they have X number of hours of training. Um, there's, so there's those things that get put into place. There's um, you know, employee preferences. That's another big driver, too, because a big thing is attrition rates. And how do we keep people happy? How do we keep our employees engaged and happy and not looking elsewhere? Um, and so employee preferences, we're seeing a lot of our clients um, incorporating employee preferences into their scheduling process. And so allowing their employees to do things like um, you know, put in their work requests right to their planning system and be able to look at vacation times and sick times and other things like that, as well as you know, seniority levels. So the most senior person gets to bid on a particular job first. So there can be just infinite number of rules and regulations. And one of the things we do at Quintic is we, especially as we're setting up the implementation, is to make sure that there's 100% fit to all those different business rules, and if it can't be done, um, then we're not gonna, we're not going to engage in the project. But we've yet to see that happen. So uh, fortunately, the, our software has been able to incorporate those hundreds of business rules, so that they can truly have something that is compliant, um, that is meeting all the regulations that you need, but also incorporating employee preferences. So at the end of the day, the employees are happy with with uh, the outcome of their schedules and their plans. 
That's a, that's a great uh, point in terms of, of being able to incorporate the, the employee, uh, you know, preferences. I mean, obviously that, that plays a key role in, in retention, which is a, um, uh, something that a lot of uh, companies are very focused on, right? Because, you know, it's one thing to hire uh, an employee, um, but it's another thing to, to then retain them and being able to incorporate that into their workforce planning. You know, their, their preferences, I think, is, is, is critically in, in important. And I think when you just talked, you know, as you were talking, it just made me, you know, realize again, you know, how difficult it is to do this in a spreadsheet when you're thinking about all these different constraints and rules and, and things that you have to take into consideration, right? If you try to do it manually or try to do it on a spreadsheet, you're going to miss some of those things or you're not going to be able to, you know, do it as effectively, um, you know, by, by doing it, you know, manually. We often find a lot of the work rules and all the needed items are, are in the planner's heads. You know, so, you know, who's our best planner? Let's go talk to them. Oh, yeah, train the other planners and this is the things you need to incorporate. We can't do it in our tool that we're using right now, be it a spreadsheet or some other, you know, simple off-the-shelf solution. But you know, it's that inherent knowledge can't be trapped in someone's head, <laughs> not anymore, anyway. Right. No, I, I, absolutely. I mean, some some folks may view that as uh, job security, right? But uh, at the end of the day, uh, yeah. you know, it's important for the good of the company and, and the good of everyone, really, for for that knowledge to be uh, systematized in, in in some ways, right? Um, so, so, you know, obviously, again, you, you work with a lot of companies uh, in, in this area. I mean, when you look at the, the, the companies that are doing it right, um, you know, certainly I, I heard some great case studies at your user conference. I mean, what are, you know, what, what are some of the things that they're doing to improve their workforce planning capabilities? And what lessons can other companies learn from them? Yeah, so I think um, we touched on a little earlier around uh, planning across all different time horizons. Um, so, you know, looking at... I look at, like, say, KLM Airlines that we work with, and, and what they're using uh, workforce planning for is primarily for pilot training and pilot transitions during that training, and incorporates back into their schedule for who can fly when. Um, and it's a really big, it's a really big driver um, uh, for the airlines and their, and, their, and their costs, and making sure that they have uh, the right pilots scheduled for the right flights, and you know that kind of thing. So, you know, that's one situation where they're doing that. Um, you know, we have another airline, you know, so same industry, but they're using Quintic to make sure that they have the most efficient process for handling all the ground handling stuff. So moving of bags, uh, you know, scheduling at the gates. Um, so they want to make sure that they're supporting their, their, their customers as well as they possibly can and, and getting them through that process. So at the end of it, you know, the customers aren't frustrated with the airline for, you know, how their, say their bags are being handled. And we sort of take some of that for granted, right? Uh, but done really well, can build, build a lot of brand loyalty as well. And then other, other industries like utilities and telecommunications where you have a lot of field service workers. And what they're doing, uh, what we're seeing uh, customers do in that space is they're doing the planning not just for their, for their workforce, for their field techs who are out running around every day, but also for the vehicles um, you know, and also for the routes that they're planning as well. And the equipment and the parts, you know, very important. Uh, factors to consider because in a field service environment, you know, things like first time fix rates are big metrics that they have to be measured on. And meeting SLAs and, and at the end of the day having a really good net promoter score that they can pitch out to the marketplace. Um, so being able to tie in the planning for the equipment, the parts, the people, the vehicles, having it all in one holistic system where you can make sure that you know if any one part of those four is missing, you're not you're going to fail in terms of that in terms of that task or that job that, that that employee is being asked to do. So, so you know, we see it, you know, workforce planning being done a lot of different ways across a lot of different industries. Um, so it's really based upon, you know, what are your goals for your company? What are you trying to accomplish this year? Um, what are the key drivers that you need to improve upon and figure out a way to make the best plan to, to achieve that goal? No, great, great, great examples there. And, and certainly the service parts piece is, is uh, one that I've looked at in the past as well, because you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, I think that a lot of times there's a lot of focus on, you know, the, the routing of the truck, right, and making sure that the truck arrives, uh, you know, with the part uh, to repair the, that whatever it needs to get repaired. But a lot of times that service technicians coming, you know, separately and being able to align the two together and align the uh, the skills and the capabilities of that technician with the part and the job that needs to be done and making sure that they arrive there on, on time, right, uh, is, is so important. And again, it, you, we take it for granted as consumers, you know, when we call someone to come in and repair the, our fridge or whatever, 
and uh, really understanding everything that takes has to take place behind the scenes to make that an effective customer experience. Um, you know, it's it's pretty cool. Um, yeah, you can provide every vehicle as a driver, right? So <laughs> if you're missing that workforce component, you're missing a piece of the equation. Uh, ab absolutely, absolutely. So so let's talk about you know some of the challenges. I mean, obviously, you, you know. Um, I'm sure that there are some challenges either, you know, to get started or that companies have to overcome in order to, you know, effectively de deploy this. I mean, what are what are some of the challenges that companies typically run into when they're trying to kind of improve their workforce planning capabilities and, and how do they overcome them? Yeah, I think that probably the biggest one is probably just you know, the standard fear of change. You know, anytime you're changing from a comfortable environment, um, you know, maybe comfortable, but it's probably not efficient and that's why they're changing. Um, so I think change management is probably the biggest piece of it. Um, so there's obviously there's change in maybe the type of software that they're using. You know, if they're using you know, Quintic now versus say a spreadsheets or some off the shelf thing. Um, you know, but there's also the process change. Um, so in some situations, companies find that uh, you know we're talking to one organization right now that's you know considering going from kind of a fixed route of scheduling of, of vehicles. Um, to being more of a dynamic routing system. And they never were able to do that before. But now that they have that capability, it's, well, what does that mean for, you know, you know, is it going to be a, you know, how much of a gain is that going to be for our business? Are we, how much efficiencies are we going to have? And how's it really going to work? And so one of the big parts of our implementations is making sure our customers are really comfortable um, with those changes. And they're done incrementally uh, throughout the process so that it isn't just a big bang. You know, it can be done in phase, phases over time uh, to make sure that they're comfortable with that, that the planners are comfortable with it, uh, the people being scheduled are comfortable with it, because now maybe the uh, people being scheduled maybe now are getting their schedules on, on, their, on their iPad or on their iPhone, you know, instead of being sent an email or get, getting a phone call or having to log on to some system. Um, so there's just little things around that, and uh, I think the better you can help prepare people for change, and, you know, now that we've... We've done this so many times. We've, I think, we've seen just about every example of, of, you know, where it can go wrong and how to fix that for for the future. So, um, walking customers through that and making them comfortable that, you know, this change is it really is for the better. Um, and you know, I think uh, once people are running in the new environment for a few months' time, they look back and think, you know, how are we ever doing it the way we were doing it in the past? It's scary. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I that, that that's so true. I mean, certainly change management, I think, is is one of those common, you know, um, obstacles and things that companies have to get over. Um, you know, the other thing that I always see in in um, as another challenge is just the, co the collecting the data, the knowledge, the information to kind of set up. I mean, do you see that as well uh, as kind of uh, in terms of a deployment? You know, kind of the data collection, making sure it's accurate, making sure it's in the right format. Making sure that the system is configured, you know, representing those work rules, for example, or or, or skill sets adequately, so that when you kind of hit go, if you will, you know, it's it's not the garbage in, garbage out. Yeah, yeah, that's a big piece of it. And um, so while the data formatting is is not really an issue for us, um, you know, it's it's more about what are all those key data sources you might be able to pull from. And I think um, sometimes it's it's systems that they never had to pull from before for planning and. And now that they're able to do it, they're able to gain a whole new window into things like employee vacations and, and things like that, rather than having to call an employee and figure out, are you going to be available next week? Um, so you know, that's one piece of it, is, is incorporating all those different data elements across the enterprise. Um, because we have some customers that are plugging in like HR data, um, you know, Salesforce data, um, you know, obviously from the ERP system for orders. And, and so it's all across the enterprise. So that's one piece. But the other piece you mentioned too was around all the business rules that need to be configured. Um, there can be hundreds of business rules that need to be configured uh, in order to create what you know, we consider to be a truly optimized plan. Um, and so to really squeeze every you know, little stitch of efficiency out of a project, you want to make sure to have all those business rules in place that you're not violating any key rules and you are driving your KPIs for your business in the most effective manner. Because uh, you know, no one buys software anymore because it's cool, you know, because it looks neat or be fun to play with. No, it's, it's enterprise level software. You buy it to have business impact and business results. And so I think, um, you know, making sure that whatever they get at the end of the implementation is really driving those business results and being able to measure it against a benchmark of where they were at the beginning is, 
is critical and it can be very, very eye-opening uh, when someone has that comfort level that, hey, we made the right decision, thank you. Well, you just uh, uh, kind of uh, with with that last comment kind of leads me to my next question, which is, you know, how do you measure, you know, the value and benefits of workforce planning? I mean, in other words, you know, if you're in the elevator with the CEO and CFO of, of one of your prospective customers, I mean, how would you, uh, you know, communicate the value and benefits to get their uh, support to invest in this area? Yeah, I mean, it's, I look at it. Again, I, you probably heard this in the talk track a little bit from me already, but I'm one of the reasons I was so excited about, about coming here is when I first saw the software and I saw what it was able to do and I saw some of the KPIs reflected in the results and saying, wow, by just making that one little incremental change, you just reduced overtime costs by 10%, which equated to you know $7.6 million off of a couple clicks of a button. You know, Those are pretty simple metrics to be able to justify a project. Um, that's one piece of it. But the other piece, too, is also it depends on who you're talking to. Are you the CEO of a service-driven organization where you're getting beat up in the marketplace right now because you know, your customer service scores are, are you know, in fourth place? Um, so you know, maybe it's around you know, meeting service level agreements with your customers, or maybe it's you know, your first time fix rates, or maybe it's time to complete jobs out in the field. Um, so it really depends on you know, what are the most important metrics to a business right now, and what are you trying to drive? And that's kind of where I encourage my team to, to, to begin the conversation um, with, with new prospects is to, you know, is to ask those questions. You know, why are you talking to us? You're not talking to us just because you want cool software. You know, that's fun for the planners. <laughs> you know, at the end of the day, what's this going to do for your business? And, and if we can't really answer that question, then we, it's probably just a nice you know, science experiment for someone to play around with some, some, some fun optimization software. Right. I mean, I think ultimately, uh, you know, the objective is always to you know, tie the value proposition to, you know, obviously for the CEO and CFO to items in the, you know, balance sheet and, and P&L, but also to, you know, their strategic objectives, right, and where they want to take the company over the next year and then obviously over the next five years. And in this case, you know, what role is, is the workforce, right, going to play in enabling to achieve those those strategic objectives? Uh, you know, Doug, we're running out of, you know, time here, kind of, so I'm going to go right to my to my last question. And, you know, as a way to wrap up, I mean, what, what questions should you know, supply chain executives ask themselves to assess if they're a leader or a laggard you know, in workforce planning? And what actions can they take today to you know, start moving up that maturity curve? Sure. Um, I think the first thing I would take a look at if I was in their shoes was to, to, to say, are we, are we doing our planning on a KPI-based approach? In other words, when we do our plans, are we actually looking at how it impacts our business? Or are we doing the plan simply to meet a basic schedule of need in the market? Um, are we doing it just to get a product out the door in a certain period of time? Or are we doing it to really drive our profitability on that service? So KPI-based planning is probably number one. Um, you know, number two would be, are we doing things across all those time horizons that we talked about? Um, so that we're not doing things in a vacuum in one department and then doing things thinking about things and planning things separately in another department that's actually on the execution side. Um, you know, it's, it's one thing for everyone to get together in a room one time a year and talk about it. You know, it's another thing to be day in, day out, being able to look at how the upstream and downstream of this process affects both the short term and the long term. And let's see if there's a third one to think about. Um, I just um, when it comes to workforce planning, you know, what are the key goals for your for your workforce this year? And it may be something like like um, reducing attrition rates. Um, you know, so you know, are we able to measure you know the impact of those schedules on anticipated overtime costs and things like that? So um, you know, knowing whatever those drivers are for your particular workforce right now, as opposed to like I said at the beginning, just kind of you know, scheduling something just to get the job done, as opposed to doing things in the most efficient manner possible. Um, so, um, you know, and, and that kind of jogs my mind to think about, you know, when, when people are using Quintic and they're building their plans, um, oftentimes they're, they're using Quintic so it can run through tens of thousands of what-if scenarios you know, to help them come up with the most optimal plan. And whether they use that plan um, is up to the planner at the end of the day, um, but I think um, are they using some kind of an optimization technique to really truly know 
that they've been through every scenario that's run through all the different calculations. And it's stuff that just, you know, we as humans can't possibly do on our own. Um, we can make gut feel and intuition decisions all day long, um, but unless we have the support of something that's that's able to do that, you know, those, you know, those millions of calculations, then you know, perhaps we're leaving money on the table. No, great, uh, great words of advice and, and uh, ideas there. Actually, that w one of the ideas you just uh, talked about, I think, probably sets up uh, the topic for a future conversation. And, and that is, you know, it, it struck me that, you know, workforce planning, uh, what's happening in workforce planning is similar to what's happening in other areas of supply chain management, where, you know, to do it right, it really has to be transformed from being kind of an ad hoc, once in a while type of, of exercise to truly becoming a continuous business process. And, um, you know, it seems to me that that's, uh, you know, uh, 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 there's a lot of food for thought in, the, in that area, maybe a, a topic uh, to, to bring you back in the program to talk about in a future episode. But uh, like I always say, Doug, at the end of all our episodes here, we always just manage to scratch the surface on, on these topics. But I think we got the uh, the conversation started out well today, um, you know, getting some of these ideas out and getting people, you know, thinking about uh, workforce planning and, and, you know, steps that they can take, you know, moving forward to you know, start moving up the maturity curve here. So I want to thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to be with us today. No, oh, thanks for having me, Adrian. Appreciate it. It was fun. Great. I want to thank all of you who joined us live today. We uh, we didn't get any questions live, but um, if you do have a question for Doug, you can find uh, this episode on TalkingLogistics.com, and you can post a question or a comment there, and I'm sure Doug will be more than happy to respond via that medium. So again, thank you all for joining us, and look forward to seeing you in a future episode of Talking Logistics. Have a great day.